official kickoff, and we're so happy to be celebrating food, culture, Hispanic Heritage Month, and just the opening of our APEX season. Uh, what a joy it is to be able to host this weekly series and to provide these great events for you. Today, we have in residence with us Gustavo Ariano. Uh, Gustavo, for more than a decade, has been a publisher and editor of the Great Orange County uh, Weekly, and also has been an author of many books. We have his book, Taco USA, available for sale and signing today after the event. But in addition to that, he's written some other books. Probably one of the ones that we'll get into a little bit today that made him most famous was his Ask a Mexican column, which then turned into a book and also eventually a play. He's won numerous awards, uh, and some of them are the 2006, 2008 Best Non-Political Column in a Large Circulation Weekly uh, from the Association of Alternative News Weeklies, 2007 President's Award from the Los Angeles Press Club, and an Impacto Award from the National Hispanic Media Coalition, also a 2008 Latino Spirit Award from the California Latino Legislative Caucus. Uh, He's been on food shows, he knows all kinds of different food reviewers and writers, and, and we're just so happy to have him celebrating his work, celebrating tacos, celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month for the next couple days with us. So without further ado, please welcome Gustavo Ariano. Okay, well. <laughs> I think I'm on now, there we go. Here we go. <laughs> We have a mic check to start. So. It happens. Welcome to SUU. Welcome to the stage. Thank you so much for being here. Gracias for having me. Absolutely. And you have been such an easy guest. So amazing. Thank you for your um, just ease of personality and just your generosity with your time. I'm a nerd. We're easy to get along with. <laughs> Well, no from, pro. from one nerd to another, <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Um, I kind of would like to start by uh, talking to you about your path in writing. Um, and the first question that I have for you is, is, was there a moment in your childhood or growing up where you knew reporting, journalism, this is it for me? No, absolutely not. Especially for those of you who are aspiring writers in the audience or just anyone in general, I think you could really get a lot of instruction, sort of my path to where I'm at today. So growing up, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. All, the only goal I had in life was to live somewhere where I could dedicate an entire room as my library. Because just fill it up with as many books as possible. That's it. I didn't know how I was going to get there. I didn't know where I was going to get the money to do that. I just wanted to do that. So you know, growing up, and I was one of those nerds. I'm sure some of you are some of those nerds. You know, the ones that don't really do, don't do the homework, but get A's in your tests and then get C's and D's for your classes. That was the type of nerd I was in high school. And then I ended up going to community college. Then I thought I wanted to be a filmmaker. But then, you know, so I went along that for a little bit. And then I went over to a, a small university called Chapman University in Orange County, where oh, I'm yeah. from. Yeah, and, and so I still pursued that path. And then everything changed one day when I uh, saw a newspaper called the OC Weekly that I had never read before. I had never really cared about news in the first place. Uh, I mean, I like sports and the comic section and a little bit of entertainment for the daily newspapers out there, the LA Times, the Orange County Register. But there was an article, it, it's a very long story, so I'll make it short, but there was an article in the OC Weekly that inspired me so much to write an angry letter, a fake angry letter oh. to the editor that um, it got published and slowly but surely that editor, uh, the founder of the OC Weekly, he saw a writer in me where I didn't know one existed. And he finally coaxed it out of me to become a writer. This is, my first story got published in 2000. I ended up becoming the editor of the OC Weekly in 2011. So from a random wacko letter to the editor to editor in, a, in about 10 years, that's my path. Can you tell us what the topic was? Yeah, oh yeah, easily. Um, it was an April Fool's issue, kind of like The Onion, for those of you who know what The Onion yeah. is. All like real fake news, not fake fake news. Um, and it was about, it, it was, so it was a whole satire about life in Orange County, and they had an article called Five Latinos We Really Like, and it had a couple problems. The first problem, there's only four people on it. <laughs> the second problem, all, the three actual people were just dyed in the wool, anti-Mexican, politicians, white supremacists, really, really nasty wow. people. And then the only actual, quote-unquote, Latino was the old Taco Bell Chihuahua dog. Oh. 
it was satire. I knew exactly from growing up, for, for those of us old people in the audience, Mad Magazine right. and Esquire and all that, I knew what satire was. I thought it was brilliant. Jonathan Swift for the English uh, classics majors. Yeah. I, knew, I knew it was brilliant, but I also knew a lot of people were going to get upset because satire is a very dangerous tool to play with. Either it could, be, it could achieve brilliant results or it could just blow up in your face. I thought it was brilliant. I knew people were going to get upset by it. So I'm like, let me write my own fake angry letter to the editor. So my response, if you read it now, oh, God, it's really bad writing, way over the top. Like, how dare you do this? I'm going to boycott outside your offices and hold a hunger strike until you apologize to all Mexicans in Orange County. But for whatever reason, it got his fancy. So he said, well, you know, you seem like an angry young man, but also that you have passion. Why don't you... Uh, publish some stories with us. I was all of, at that point, I was all of 21. And yeah, that's how it happened. So we talked, we have a little USC, UCLA rivalry. Sure. You went to UCLA and, and was it for journalism or completely something different? So this was, uh, the, the whole letter writing campaign happened in 2000. My first article happened in Early, late 2000. Then around 2001, it was my senior year at Chapman. But at that point, I, remember, I didn't know I wanted to be a reporter at that point. I thought I was going to go, well, I applied to UCLA for its Latin American Studies program because I thought my career goal or my career path was going to be a professor of Latin American cinema at UCLA, the best film school in the country, um, as well. she laughs. Um, well. <laughs> and so I got accepted to UCLA in February of 2001, so I had to wait around until the, the quarter started in September of 2001. So in that whole time, I graduated, and I started writing more stories for the OC Weekly. So by the time I got to UCLA, I thought to myself, well, I don't know if I want to be a, a, an academic anymore. I kind of like this journalism game, but... I didn't go to school for journalism. I don't have any formal training in journalism. Let's see what happens. And then by, you know, and I had a bad experience with a very arrogant professor on my second quarter. That's when, for me, this was early 2002. That's for me, it's like, okay, I'm not gonna do academia anymore. I'm just gonna throw myself into journalism. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I believe in baptisms by fire. Yeah. You, throw, you know, throw them into, or sink or swim, what, you know, what, what, whatever your metaphor is, <laughs> your dangerous metaphor. But that's what happened. I made it happen. And so how did you work on the craft then? I mean, just on your own or what happened? Ruthless criticism from the founder, so uh, the founder of OC Weekly. So his name is Will Swaim. And so what, remember, I had no experience in journalism whatsoever, nothing. All the, all the I, I mean, it, what, at that point when I started, I could write magnificent papers about Sartre and existentialism, the French new wave, because that was my training in film or like, you know, pop, apocalyptic imagery in the war film, 1925 to 1945, right, you know, right around the World War II era. But in terms of layman of layman's terms, I couldn't write for anything. So and it showed. So if I, you know, when, it, when you're a reporter, you do what are called pitches. Like you give ideas to your editor. So let's say out of 10 pitches that I would give to Will, nine of them he would reject outright because he said they're terrible. And out of the 10 pitches that he would accept, only one of those would, pay, would actually come out of the paper. And in the meanwhile, he told me, this story's terrible, your writing's horrible, this, this. I mean, he, he had some pretty uh, choice words for me, but I knew the guy was smarter than me. I knew he was a genius, frankly. So I, so I told him, okay, if my writing is terrible, can you show me how not to be terrible? Can you literally sit me down and go line by line telling me how to fix my words, and to his credit, he did. Not most, pe not most professors do that, not most editors do that. He didn't have to, I was just some random guy, you know, random kid, frankly, who went in there, but that's how I learned. And then I also was in a newsroom environment where everyone was older than me, and there was no real egos, and I just, what do they say? Um, I just lapped up all the knowledge that they gave me. So uh, that was around, 2000, beginning in 2002, I became a staff writer by 2003. So from an angry letter to the editor to being a staff writer, that was only two years. I just learned. Wow, that's great. And so for the students in the room and aspiring writers, yeah. what, what advice then would you give them based on your experience or what should they, what takeaway do you have for them? F find someone that you know is smarter than you and pay attention to what they have to say, especially when it comes to writing, what, any creative craft or anything in general, learn how to take criticism. A lot of people, everyone thinks they're the most brilliant writer of all time and everyone thinks, oh, you shouldn't have changed that word because this was the word that was gonna change the world. No, 
Be, but you have to find you have to find that brilliant person. You have to find that mentor. And believe it or not, if if they're good if they're good writers, they will gladly take on uh, mentees. If they're good writers, if you find someone that says no, I don't have time for you. You don't want to be with those people. You don't want to be with toxic people. But find the people that are going to challenge you. Also, you don't want. I I know it's a stereotype. But, oh, you know, participation trophies or anything like that. No, right. you want somebody who's going to challenge you, who's going to call you out on everything that you do. Be, they're calling you out not to stroke their own ego, they're doing it to make you into a better writer. Again, they don't have to do this. You know, they're do they better be doing it for free. You better not be paying anyone to make you into a better writer, except of course, university. Um, <laughs> That's, you know, th that's, that's what you need. You need to find those mentors and also don't exist as an island unto yourself. F you know, find yourself a group. And, you know, again, you have, to find a, you have to find a group of people that you can trust, that you know they're going to tell it to you as it is, but they're also going to be there to help you become a better person, a better writer specifically. I, I love that concept. I think the, the value of mentorship and, um, as you say, the, the avoiding the participation trophy type thing, really finding somebody who will critique you and will really help you make, you make you feel better. So that's great advice. Yeah, no, I, you know, and I, I learned that. And, you know, once I became the editor, I would get these interns and I would tell them, like, look, I'm a very busy person. I'm incredibly busy but I'm always gonna have time for you. But it has to be a give or give and take. Like, I'm gonna tell you stuff, and, and if you wanna challenge me, please challenge me. And also, again, a, a, that's what a good mentor does. Like, you have, a, you, this is not lecturing from up above, down below. No, it should be a relationship, and you can challenge. And if you're a smart mentor, you're also gonna learn from the people that you're doing. So I would always tell my writers, like, I have my ideas, my ideas, you know, my, my word is a final word because I am the editor of the paper. But if you think I'm wrong, challenge me. And if I think you're going to, and if I think you have a better idea than me, we'll go with your idea. More, and more often than not, it happened. That's really the kind of, I, I think, the kind of education and the kind of teaching and mentorship that we really strive for here at SU. So you just absolutely hit it right <laughs> on the head. So. Yeah, the Socratic method. Yeah. I, I mean, for lack of a better term, question, answer, answer, question. Right. I like that. Well, tell me about Ask a Mexican, because I think a lot of people uh, know that as sort of your first kind of big splash type thing. How did that come about? It's turned into a book and a play yeah. even, I yeah. heard. And <laughs> tell us about how that came to be. So Ask a Mexican, if you haven't heard of it, which you probably haven't, it was a column that I did from 2004 up until last year. And its premise is very simple. You would have questions about Mexicans, I would answer them. And it didn't matter what the questions were. They could be racist questions, they could be sexist questions, they could be questions about history, about taxes, about little people, about whatever you could possibly imagine. And the purpose of the column, it was not comedy, because people would always say, oh, you should be a stand-up comedian. I'm like, I can't tell a joke worth the life of me, I really can't. But the purpose of the column, it was satirical, but it was really to debunk and deconstruct stereotypes about Mexicans. Uh, you know, I'm a Mexican descent, my parents are Mexican immigrants, I'm sure we'll get to that in a little bit. But um, especially in Orange County, I started that column at a time where kind of like today, there was a lot of questions about what, a you know, what Mexican immigration was doing to the United States, whether it was gonna change it fundamentally, whether these Mexicans were going to be Americans or whether, whether they were gonna take down the United States or whatever. And uh, you know, as, as someone in whose first language that they spoke was Spanish when they entered kindergarten, and here I am talking to all of you in English because I learned English from watching, what was it, Transformers and Bud's Bunny cartoons <laughs> and Spurs. I'm a child of the 80s. <laughs> so I decided to take on the racism that I know was happening in Orange County, but do it in a humorous way, but also with the facts, with the absolute facts. So eventually the column ended up getting circulated in about 38 newspapers. It came on the Salt Lake City Weekly. Those of you who go up to Salt Lake was there for a couple years. And it had its critics and it had its admirers, but I like doing the column at the very least because... I, you know, I just like, I guess overall, I like answering any question people have about anything. And if it was about Mexicans, hey, let's play ball. Was it a pitch that you made or how did it, like, did you just dream it up one day and said, I'm going to do this? Or did he come to you? How yeah, yeah, no, the, the editor of the OC Weekly will. So one day we were at the, we had our fifth story offices. So one day he comes to me and he says like, oh, you see that billboard out there in the horizon? And yeah, I'm like, yeah. Like, so who is that guy? Like, it's a... It's, it's a, like, a, I know he's a DJ because it says FM and 99 point whatever, but he's wearing a Viking helmet and he has long hair and his eyes are crossed and I think his name is Piolin or something. And I looked at him, I'm like, his name's El Piolin. 
El Piolín, most of you probably don't know who he is, but at one point he was the most listened to DJ, radio DJ in the United States, larger audience than Rush Limbaugh. It was an interesting show. It, you know, it was a music show, so they would play Mexican regional music. And then when he would talk, half of it would just be Howard Stern, raunchy jokes, but the other stuff would be like advocacy journalism. He'd have doctors on the air taking people's phone calls, immigrant phone calls, how, you know, I have this, this hurts me, what should I do? He would have educators on to get their, uh, get, you know, to tell parents, keep your kids in school, taking them after school programs. So really, really interesting mix. And so I told Will, I'm like, you're pretty dumb for knowing not who El Piolin is. Not because you're a white man and all white people are supposed to know about, Mex are supposed to know everything about Mexicans automatically, but because you're the editor of the OC Weekly, El Piolin first started in Santa Ana, so you should know the community that you're covering. And he could have been mad at me, but he said, you know, there's a lot of people who have questions about Mexicans. Some of them are racist, but not uh, most people aren't. Like, it's just like a simple question. For instance, some of you might have thought about in the past, why does so much Mexican music either have accordions or uh, tubas, like umpa music, like Oktoberfest? That's not a racist question. It has a legitimate answer because like the United States, Mexico is also a culture of immigration. And so you had German and Czech immigrants. The Czech immigrants ended up in northern Mexico. They brought the accordion. The German immigrants ended up in a coastal state called Sinaloa. They brought their bass, brass bands. And so something like that. And so I like the challenge. So I said, but I also thought no one's going to be interested in it. Like I wasn't afraid that it was going to be politically incorrect. I don't care about that as long as there's a purpose to it. But I, as a writer, you want to write stories that people are going to read, that are going to have an impact. And I just didn't think that column would have that. Well, we published the first question and at the very bottom of the column, hey, if you have any questions about Mexicans, here I am. I didn't think anything was going to happen. Uh, our paper comes out every Thursday. We have staff meetings, at, or we had staff meetings at 11. By that staff meeting at 11, I already had 50 questions. Just wow. right, And I'm like, and, as, and also as a reporter, when you hit a nerve, you know to keep hitting that nerve. <laughs> yeah. So we said, well, we'll just do this column until there's no more questions to be answered. Well, it went from 2004 to 2017. The questions never stopped. That's amazing. And I, were there questions that would come up repeatedly? Were there any sort of best hits, sort of, as you will? Uh, the, the interesting thing is, remember, this was a nationally syndicated column. I got thousands of questions over the years. I ended up, if, you know, if our, my column would come out, two, like, two, uh, two questions per week, 50 weeks out of the year. So I answered over a thousand questions and my book, half of it was questions brand new to the audience. So I would say 75% of them were unique questions. But yeah, you had some repeats. The Mexican music one's a classic. Uh, another one, uh, why do Mexicans love? Insert the name of your favorite English language group. So you could see it, it could be, why do Mexicans like Morrissey so much? Why do Mexicans <laughs> like Led Zeppelin so much? Why do Mexicans like Depeche Mode so much? Why do, it's like people cannot understand that Mexicans could actually like music that doesn't involve a big hat. It's amazing. <laughs> and I would answer the questions. I would answer the questions with facts, with humor. But I, I always thought the best, question, the best questions were those where I could actually answer it on stats and on just you know history, history yeah. especially. And doing it for so long, uh, you know, over a decade of that particular column, did you ever get frustrated? I mean, is it something where you were just like, oh, I, I can't, I can't believe I'm still answering these. I mean, did it get frustrating or did it always stay fresh and like, I want to help with this? In a way, the fact that there was even a co advice column about Mexicans, that's scary. That's scary. <laughs> that, in a way. But I could do one or two things with that. I could either have gone in that corner and cried and weeped and moaned, oh, Mexicans were so un misunderstood. Everyone's racist. I'm, I'm, I wasn't raised that way. Mm -hmm. For me, it's like, all right, you have a question. I'll answer it. I, and, you know, and remember, I had the final word, so you, I, you know, I would give you an answer. You might not like my answer, but I would like that answer because I was the one who was publishing it. And since it was new questions every week, oh no, I mean, you could never get tired. The question, and by the way, I never made up a single question, only the very first one, but every other question after that, I would only clean it, clean it up for grammatical purposes sometimes, or I'd cut them down, but like, like the questions people would have, like I always, like, People, I, I, like, I won't say what the most offensive question was. Like, you could ask me individually, just you know, for the sake of the audience, but I could tell you what I thought the craziest question someone ever asked me was. Someone asked me, is it true that George W. Bush's grandfather, so we're talking about Prescott Bush, is it true that Prescott Bush stole the head of Pancho Villa? 
like when I got this, I'm like, and it's not an offensive question. It's just the most random question. I'm like, where is this coming from? I did the research, and as and I could say definitively that no, Prescott Bush did not steal the head of Pancho Villa. But there's a whole conspiracy theory around it to the point that when George Herbert Walker Bush ran for office, a reporter with the New Yorker of all places asked him that question. Wow. It was a, the most the most bizarre thing. And, and so the, the short of it is, is that, you know, Prescott Bush, along with all the other Bushes, they went to Yale. They belonged to the Skull and Bone Society, very secretive organization. So they the, the mythology of the Skull and Bones is that, yeah, they went and they stole the head of Pancho Villa and also the skull or the skull of Pancho Villa, but also the skull of Geronimo. So where do people have questions like that? But again, am I just going to leave it alone? No. As a, as a, as a, someone who wants to learn, I went off and learned it. And, and one of the things I've really enjoyed talking to you in the last day or so is, is that desire for learning, that curiosity. And you talk a little bit about your spidey sense as a reporter. <laughs> so tell us a little bit. I, I mean, your life now is really interesting. Um, we were talking about how you go around and find stories. Tell us a little bit about like what your current setup is. I will write for anyone who will have me. And I don't say that out of desperation, like, please give me a job. So, uh, uh, you know, before that, let me preface that with I left the OC Weekly uh, last year in October. It was my dream job. It was the only job I ever wanted, and I had it as editor for six years. But I left it because my owner wanted me to lay off half the staff, and I refused. So I've been a, I, I've, I've been a freelancer ever, ever since. I write a weekly column about California, the entire state, for the Los Angeles Times. But also in that year, I've written I, – I basically – this year, I'm like, you know what? Every dream publication I've ever wanted to write, let me see if I could write for them. And so far, so good. I've written for The New Yorker. I've written for Time Magazine. I've written for, oh, geez, what's the, I'm going to start writing for High Country News, this really great magazine that comes out. I've written for uh, ESPN, the magazine. I've written for Jezebel. I've written all these little stories, just, and, and random stuff. Like, recently, I wrote a story for Thrillist, this kind of, Kind of hipster millennial website, but I think does really good stuff. But they asked me, hey, can you find out who invented the term Taco Tuesday? I'm like, okay, sure. And I did it. And I'll save that story later on. But yeah, just, and so as a writer now, but you know, if you have it in your bones, especially as a reporter, you're always looking for stories. Even right now, like the less than 24 hours that I've had here in, in uh, Cedar City, I'm, I've already seen like, oh, that could be a story. That could be a story. Like, as a writer, you know when there's a, a story is there for you, and you also have to be open for it all the time. Like, there's never a time where, like, okay, I'm going to turn off being a reporter. No. Right. Always, always. Well, let's get into the book, and let's get into the writing. And I, I have, I mean, this book will make you so hungry, and we definitely have them for sale, and Gustavo will be available to sign them. And I think that was one of the things that you say is that you kind of wanted to make people hungry with the book. <laughs> And the quote that I have is just great. You're talking about Manuel's special, this one particular five pounds, beans and rice and guacamole and sour cream and your choice of meat, juicy nubs of grilled chicken, carne asada burned into succulent charcoal, uh, shredded beef that sticks between molars for hours afterwards. Uh, and you talk about it being wrapped in a flour tortilla that if laid fat, flat can serve as a swaddling cloth for a puppy. I mean... I try too hard. It's just awesome. <laughs> but Thank you. And, and this, this kind of uh, just... I don't know, lyrical, you know, sumptuous writing is just throughout the book. So Thank let's you. get into it. And, and can you tell me, before we get into specific taco, tortilla, salsa, all these things, how did the book come to be? So I was in New York City. That would have been 2008. My second book, Orange County of Personal History, had just been released, so I had a book signing. So I was with my book editor and my book agent at the time. And another thing, um, at the OC Weekly, the longest job I had was as a food critic. So I had been writing about food almost from the beginning, since 2001. I had a weekly column also about uh, just hole-in-the-wall restaurants or whatever. So I, I, we go to this dinner at some fancy place place. Um, and I tell him like, ah, this food's whatever. I, 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 we should go to the place I was back earlier. I went to this Haitian restaurant that had fried goat with like, it was pink beans. They, they weren't, um, they weren't garbanzo beans. There was this pink beans with a white rice. And then they had this vinegar sauce that was, that had habaneros inside of it. And just a crunch. I love goat. If you don't, if you've never had goat, very underrated meat. Oh, um, oh I love it. O only the world's superior cultures like goat. Um, <laughs> 
Think about that. Um, <laughs> So, so I'm describing it, describing it, and my, my agent and my book editor, they're like, the next book you should write about is food, and you should write about Mexican food. And, and this is another interesting thing about me. I, like, you'll get, I'll get offers, and at first I dismiss them, but then I smarten up, and then I realize, like, oh, why, why are you, like, ignoring this? So at first I'm like, no, there's all these books about Mexican food, all these cookbooks by, like, Bobby Flay and Rick Bayless and all these other people. It, but it, the idea stuck in my mind because they're like, no, you should do something about the history of Mexican food. And I still assumed that people had done it. So that night I go back to my hotel room. I go to Amazon. I just start Googling different Mexican cookbooks and all that. And it turned out no one had done ever a full-fledged history of Mexican food in the United States. There are histories of Mexican food in Mexico. There's little chapters on various things. And then as a reporter, I start looking at these things. And then I start seeing, um, how can I put this? I start seeing mythologies for what they were. So I just start Googling like, oh, like who invented the margarita? All of a sudden there's like 12 different origin stories from the somewhat plausible, so the one that I believe is the most, no one knows by the way for sure, the most plausible one I believe is that the margarita is a take on a prohibition era drink called the tequila daisy. And a daisy, the daisy flower in Spanish is a margarita. So and it's almost the exact same cocktail so that's the most plausible one. And then to the completely implausible, some people think that the margarita is named after Rita Hayworth because Rita Hayworth's real name is Margarita. It wasn't named after Rita Hayworth. So I start seeing all these mythologies. So as a reporter, I'm like, there's a story there and a story there. So I just started crafting this book. Oh, for two years, I, I traveled all around the United States eating nothing but Mexican food. It was magnificent. <laughs> So that was kind of the prep, right? You just sort of went and started traveling. And Archives, eating. interviewing people, eating, getting suggestions, getting more suggestions. And more importantly, and I talk about this in my book, having assumptions, yes, but then also allowing those assumptions to be proven completely, completely wrong. And yeah, the book came out in 2012. It's interesting because it sold well. Ask a Mexican was a national bestseller. My second book was a complete bomb, but that's a whole other story. Then the third book sold well at initially, but it's been, it just keeps selling and selling and selling ever since. So my publisher is very happy with it. And it's had, a, it's had a completely, it keeps reinventing, not reinventing itself, but it keeps replenishing itself as Mexican food, even though it already was in 20, 2012 part of our day-to-day -day diet, but it just becomes more and more popular and more and more innovations happen and more and more stories start, start coming out of it. And you sort of talk about how it, it has had this long resurgence as food culture has transformed in the last even five years. Yeah. Do you have comments on, on, on your perception of how food culture has changed even since the book was published? Oh my God, food is cool now. <laughs> food is cooler than ever before, which I know sounds strange, but with, you know, with one of these, Instagram, like almost everyone takes photos of their food and then they post it to Instagram or Snap or whatever your social media is. You're all trying to show your neighbors, your family, your friends, hey, I found this really cool spot. And so that has also changed how the food industry approaches their food. Now everything has to be, you know, Instagram ready and pretty and all of that. But also that's also showing people different food ways that maybe they would have never really thought of. And this really goes, like, I, I, would, I would argue more than five years, probably like a 10 to 15 years ago with the Food Network. And then you also ha start having these chains realizing, hey, we have a specific style that maybe might travel. So, you know, the Southern California example, of course, in and out in and out the very famous cheeseburger chain, has spread uh, to Utah, to a little bit Arizona, Texas, but also Utah. Your famous Mexican uh, restaurant chain, Cafe Rio, it came into Orange County about a decade ago. I like it. I like their tortillas, their flour tortillas, best of all. They do good stuff. But so, and they're finding success because they're coming with their style of food into an audience that historically had never even considered, considered it and vice versa. Yeah. And in the book, I mean, of course, we'll get into tacos and we want to tease little bits of the book and, and there's just so much great stuff in it. It, some of the earliest food in the U.S. that really kind of made a name for itself was not actually tacos. It was more tamales, chili. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the, the two, the, 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 okay, so I'll, I'll give you the two assumptions that I had in my book, and I, I, I admit them. The first assumption that I had that was that up until around the, the late 1960s, that Mexican food was not popular in the United States outside of the American Southwest. And the second assumption was that there was such a thing as authentic Mexican food, which we'll leave the authentic part for later. But the, both of them are completely wrong, by the way. So it turned out that as, as soon as Americans 
tasted Mexican food, they became obsessed with it. And this is something going all the way back to the 1860s, but really starting in earnest in the 1880s with two dishes. People are amazed that tacos are a relatively recent migrant into the United States. They didn't come into the United States until the 1900s, uh, 1910s, with the, right after the Mexican Revolution. And tamales are actually probably the quintessential, well, actually the most, Mex the most American Mexican dish is what we now know as chili. You know, chili dogs, chili burgers, chili from a can. But when it first became popular, it was known as chile con carne. It came from Texas, and it was considered a Mexican dish. But Americans loved it so much that they assimilated it to the point where they dropped the con carne part, they turned the E into an I, and now we know it as chili. But just as popular are tamales. Tamales, of course, one of the first, one of the oldest meals in the world that has relatively not changed. All it is is masa, corn turned into a corn dough, and then a filling inside, and that's and there's your tamales. Well, tamales, Americans were eating tamales starting in the 1880s all across the United States, really after the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. I mean, I did this research. So you had tamales in Utah going back to the 1890s. You had tamale, send, uh, tamale parlors, tam tamale vendors, those tamale, or like men, uh, 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 with their little uh, tamale pails going all around. And then the advent of the tamale mans ended around the 1920s, 1930s, because by then you had a brand new phenomenon in the tamale world, tamales in a can. How many of you have ever had tamales in a can? Raise your hand. Yeah, this totally you see? surprised me. They exist, people. Because uh, you talk to especially younger folks, especially Latinos, they're like, what, tamales in a can? Are you kidding me? That's absolutely impossible. But that showed how much Americans wanted Mexican food, that they subjected themselves for decades to tamales in a can. It was a multi-million dollar industry. There's only one place now that, I st that's actually a story, I have to do it. Yeah. But there, there is one place now that makes tamales in a can and they sell it to like preppers and survivalists. It's like, it, it's Southern California because now you don't need tamales in a can because almost every Mexican restaurant or most, uh, most places in the United States have some people who could make fresh tamales. Yeah. But it, again, it shows just going back to the 1880s until today, Americans have loved Mexican food. What were those tamales in a can? I mean, I've never seen, what were the, it, small, I'm thinking like sardines, you know, or is Not it that bigger? small, no, 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 no. Small folks uh, wrapped in uh, wax paper, really just, so it was corn dough, um, and then the center was very specific. They would have like beef or chicken, but it was ground. They weren't the best things, but again, Americans wanted Mexican food. Americans wanted authentic Mexican food so much that they were willing to do that. And, and that's one of the things I try to point out in my book. It's very easy to make fun of you know, non-Mexicans and their relationship with Mexican food. I'm sure you've seen uh, recently that a uh, poll showed that Taco Bell was the most popular, uh, the best Mexican restaurant in the United States. And people are crying, oh my God, Americans are so dumb with their Mexican food. No, 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 no. You are discrediting Americans. The, the main movers in making Mexican food more quote-unquote authentic have always been Americans. They have always been pushing for the next great quote-unquote authentic thing. And it's in the book. I, I have the whole thread. I, you know, I, I wrote the book. Yeah, it, it is really interesting. One of the things, just to get back to the, the chili con carne and tamale, in the early history that I found really beautiful and interesting in the book is that they have these sort of mythologies around them. They talk, you, I think it's in, it's either in New Mexico or in Texas where with the, the women serving the chili and, and the, it, it sort of had this very culture entity. And then the tamale men weren't always Hispanic, no, right? They, no. There was a lot of different cultures. And so can you talk a little bit about the, the culture around these two early foods? People have always romanticized Mexican food as well. Uh, romanticize or demonize. We'll get to demonize it later, uh, later on. But the, the most, uh, the earliest, not the earliest, but when Mexican food first became famous was in San Antonio. And in San Antonio, the culture there, the food was chile con carne, and they would have what we would now call pop-up restaurants. But from, sunri from sunset to sunrise, you would have women create these stalls. They had a big old cauldron, chile con carne, set up the table, set up some lights, uh, have uh, the men and their families play guitar, open up a restaurant. So these women uh, became known as the chili queens, you know, exotified, commodified, and all of that. that was, so that was considered to be good. On the other side were the tamale men. And the tamale men were always thought to be of a lesser nature, probably because they were fighting with each other all the time. 
absolutely true story. And as they spread across the United, the, as they spread across the United States, they it became a job for immigrants. So in the 1890s, the Tamale men in New York were Irishmen. Across the across the West in Utah, Montana, especially the the, the Upper West, most of the Tamale men were actually Muslim immigrants from the Punjab, from the area you know, Pakistan, what's now Pakistan and India. It's a cultural region, the Punjab. And same thing in Seattle, in in the South, they became African American, like. It was a way, kind of like the Mexican restaurant of today or the Chinese restaurant of today, Mexican food became a way for immigrants to make money and make money fast because there was that demand for it. Yeah, I think that that, that part of it and the, the mythology and the cultural aspect is very fascinating. Going to what you said about Americans pushing this food forward um, brings us to the, the beginning of the taco or the, the making of the fame of the taco. Yeah. And there's a, a great story which you tell in the book and I think you've also also told in the, the Netflix episode on tacos about um, San Bernardino and the birthplace of tacos and then the transition to Taco Bell. Yeah. Do you, could you give us a little short version of that? San Bernardino... Um, not exactly the best reputation in California or in the United States. Unfortunately, I think it's a great town. Um, in, in, the food, in the food world, though, it's known as the birthplace of McDonald's. And it's also where Taco Bell was born, in a sense. So when I was doing my book, I, you, know, you have to talk about Taco Bell, the, the world's most uh, widespread Mexican restaurant. So I bought the biography of the man who invented Taco Bell. His name was Glenn Bell. So I'm reading in his biography, and he admits that he got the idea for Taco Bell from a restaurant across the street from his hamburger and hot dog stand off Route 66 in San Bernardino. It was a Mexican restaurant, and he would just see lines of people for these tacos. And so every night he would go, after he'd close shop, he'd go across the street and order some tacos, take them back to his place, and try to decipher how those tacos were made. So he admits to all of this. But what, and you know, it happens. Uh, the restaurant industry is the most ruthlessly capitalistic industry ever created. This is a place where mothers and daughters will rip themselves off if that means they can make more money than the other person. Yeah, let's not romanticize the money making aspect of this. So, th so that the story didn't bother me. What did bother me, though, was that he erased the name. Like, okay, if you're gonna rip someone off, at least say what the name of the restaurant was. So I go off and do my research. I find that not I find not only the location of the restaurant, but that it's still there. It's called Meat La Cafe. It just celebrated its 80th anniversary. So I go to the restaurant. Uh, the owner now is a daughter-in-law of the founder. So Irene Montaño, she's in her 80s, still works every day, you know, a couple of hours nowadays. So I tell her, like, is it true that Glenn Bell stole your family's recipe? So, uh, so actually, I'm jumping ahead of the story. So Glenn Bell opens up his taco stand now right across the street from, taco, uh, from Meat La Cafe, then opens two other chains before uh, creating Taco Bell in, 19, I think, 1964 in the city of Downey. It's a suburb of Los Angeles. So I go to Irene, I say, is all of this true? She's like, yeah, I, we remember him. We would always see this white man coming in every night, and we could tell he's trying to rip off our recipe. So eventually my father-in-law goes up to him and say, look, if you're going to rip me off, at least rip me off right. So he invited him into his kitchen to teach him how to make tacos properly. And so I was just blown away. And so I asked Irene, I asked Irene, well, does it bother your family that Glenn Bell created a multi-billion dollar empire off of your family's heritage? And she's like, eh, good for him. You know, he's been around, they've been around for like 60 some years. We've been around for 80 years. But besides, our tacos are way better than his. <laughs> Obviously, and, and that just surprised me because especially in food, in food ways and in food culture and food journalism, you always attack people appropriating food, the issue of cultural appropriation. Here was somebody who was just very at ease. And in a, in a way, I'm like, but you're right. I mean, they had the life that they want. Now it's in the fifth generation of, the, no, not the fifth, but the, the fourth generation of ownership, the newer generation. They still have all these classic meals. They're going to open up um, a bar next door. They just opened up uh, like an event space. That's just a huge, it's a huge success. Evkin Seguera's there. They have community uh, events. They have uh, open mic nights and all that. So it's, it's a great success story. And thankfully through my book, now the people know. Like, I, and that's what made me more, I mean, I love the whole book, but more than anything, it made me proud to be able to write their story into the official narrative of Mexican food in the United States. And they get fame. They've been on the New York Times, the Food Network. They were in an episode of Ugly Delicious, a Netflix show that I came out on. And 
hopefully there will be more uh, fame for them, and they deserve it. And by the way, the, the, for people who say hard shell tacos is not real Mexican food, the recipe has not changed since 1938. Sorry, and it came with the founders of, of uh, Mitla from where they came from in the state of Jalisco in Mexico. So it's a hard shell taco with ground beef and then that rainbow of like, uh, what, what do you call it in English? Uh, cabbage, uh, 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 lechuga, you know, oh, no, no, repollo, repollo. So it's like cabbage, green cabbage, yellow, or rather uh, red tomatoes, and then the blizzard of yellow cheese. The and then you ask them, well, you know, you don't have uh, yellow cheese in Mexico. Well, yeah, yeah. in the 1930s, there was no Mexican cheese up in Mexico. So you had to make do with what you have. And then you bite it. It's like eating, living, breathing, tasty history. It's amazing. I mean, that's one of the things that's so amazing about that story is that, you know, they were making that in their home. They came to the U.S., substituted ingredients because that's what was available. And then that's what becomes Taco Bell's recipe mm -hmm. that we all know and then becomes this this representative of Mexican food. It's so fascinating, that whole transition. People love to trash Taco Bell. I do not like the food. I think it's way too salty. I was so disappointed when they came out with their Doritos logo taco because I love Doritos. Oh, my Lord. Doritos are so delicious. I wanted to ask you about we'll Doritos. We'll talk about Doritos yeah. in a little bit. Uh, but... So when I had the Doritos Loco, it was terrible. There was not enough Doritos flavor, the quote unquote meat, and I use that in quotes specifically because it's not 100% beef, and they admit to that. Um, it just wasn't good. That said, people love to trash Taco Bell. I will defend it only in the sense that I really view it as an ambassador for Mexican food. So it, came, it opened up in places that no Mexicans were. It got it whetted people's appetite for something that they knew was gonna be better that was following on their path. So in that sense, I give Taco Bell its credit. I, you know, Again, their food's terrible. I think their advertising campaigns are pretty funny. But other than that, like I don't go eat at Taco Bell, never. And so Doritos. Doritos and Disneyland? Yeah. So what's the story there? So in my book, I have all these stories. Like basically, again, I like to answer questions. So any possible question you could have about Mexican food in the United States, I probably answered it there. Uh, another, another uh, uh, how can I put this? Another fun discovery or fun story that I found out was about Doritos at Disneyland. So in about, and this is, and this is something to, again, show how mythologies quickly spread, even, even among the reputable press. So around... I want to say, let's just say 2010. I'm making up a, a date right now. But everyone from NPR to New York Times to Wall Street Journal ran obituaries on a man named Arch West. Arch West was a longtime executive for Frito-Lay. And all these obituaries said that he had invented Doritos, that he had gotten the idea of Doritos from going to a Mexican restaurant where an old man, it's always a nameless old man, of course, <laughs> had this idea, and Arch West liked the idea and introduced it to Doritos. So immediately, again, those warning signs, like, old man, no, you're making this up. But in my mind, I'm like, how can I try to figure out the truth behind Doritos? So I'm interviewing this guy, one of the pioneers of Mexican food, uh, mass-produced Mexican food in Southern California. And then somehow it comes out that he said, yeah, you know, my family invented Doritos. I'm like, come on, Really? So he comes with the documents, he comes with the paper and uh, the papers, and lo and behold, it's absolutely true. So the story, the Morales family, a family of Mexican immigrants, they had a tamale making uh, factory in Anaheim for decades. When Disneyland opens, they get the contract to be the commissary for all the restaurants in Disneyland, all of them that opened up you know, the very first day. Within a year, Walt Disney himself knew that Mexican food was very popular. So he opens up a Mexican restaurant uh, sponsored by Frito-Lay called Casa de Fritos. So everything came with Fritos, of course. They had tacos, they had this, this, and that. They're frying uh, the taco shells fresh and all that. And it was the Morales family that, um, that ran it. So one day, one of the older Morales, uh, or, or, yeah, one of the Morales people comes in. Their workers are teenagers, uh, you know, Americans. And they see that the teenagers, like, they would fry the shell wrong. They would break it, and so they would throw it away. So the Morales family goes and says, like, no, 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 don't throw them away. Like, let's reuse them. Let's put, like, some cheese powder on them or sprinkle some cheese on top of it. And let's just give them as a snack to the customers. Immediate smash, but they don't tell Frito-Lay. A year later, Arch West comes and gets angry at the Morales family. He says, you're only supposed to sell what we tell you to sell. And, and the Morales family's like, look, we're not selling them. More importantly, look at everything, like look at what a, a sensation they've become. 
So Arch West goes back to Frito-Lay. They give a contract to the family to produce them for a year. So for a year, they stop making tamales, just nonstop Frito, uh, Doritos production in Anaheim, and it becomes an, immediately, an immediate smash. So the Morales family, they ended up selling all that to uh, Frito-Lay. They're wealthy beyond belief. But yeah, so that's a true story. And then it was confirmed by other Frito-Lay executives. So the Wall Street Journal and all these people, they didn't know any better because what they did was Arch West said, yeah, I invented Frito-Lay. No one did any research on it. And a lie gets published. Wow. Yeah, I'm all about, uh, 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 how do you say, excavating lies and just burying them somewhere else. <laughs> that's great. And another topic that I think is quite beloved right now is the taco truck. Yeah. And can you talk about, um, you know, just your experience with them and, and the power that they have had in, in sort of propelling Mexican food culture? Do you have taco trucks here in Cedar City yet? Mm -hmm. Kind of getting there? They'll a little bit. A little getting bit. there. More, more are on their way coming up I-15 yes, as we speak. exactly. From L.A. Yeah, from L.A. <laughs> oh, absolutely. No, so the ta it's interesting because a taco truck... As long as there's been mobility, there's been Mexican food. So it used to be horse wagons, tamale wagons specifically, going around town, especially, especially in LA. LA, we love our mobile vehicles. Once the combustible engine became a thing, all of a sudden you had tamale vendors on their cars. And then, especially with Southern California in the 1950s, you had a lot of food trucks. There's food trucks. This is before Mexican food because there was a lot of construction. It was easy to get these food trucks out into a construction zone, feed the men that were working there and whatnot. And this is the 50s. This is the 50s, yeah. And they would sell some Mexican food, but still they'd sell cold-cut sandwiches and, you know, whatever the, the people wanted to eat at the time. The first full-fledged food truck, or uh, taco truck, came in the early 1970s, a famous chain that still exists in uh, at Los Angeles called King Taco. It was made out of a uh, tricked out uh, former ice cream, uh, ice cream truck. Everyone thought he was crazy. He parked on Olympic Boulevard in East Los Angeles, Raul Rodriguez. Everyone thought he was crazy. People said like, no one's gonna buy tacos for a truck. People want them from a taquero, from a taco man, or like from a taco, like a actual taco place. Well, it became a sensation. What's interesting, though, was that they were, all, for the most part, they were illegal, or they like they were. There was a lot of restrictions against them for decades and decades and decades. Everything changed in 2008 with a truck, another food truck called Koji or Koji or Kogi Korean Barbecue. Uh, so it was a Korean taco. So Korean barbecue inside a uh, a tortilla. All of a sudden, it became a sensation, went viral. I mean, the whole reason we have basically Instagram food and food trucks became popular was because of this one taco truck. And he's, you know, he's very humble. He's a, he's a nice guy, uh, Roy Choi. But it's interesting how Mexicans can be doing something forever, and it's looked down upon, it's considered illegal and bad and that. Then a non-Mexican does it and mainstreams it, like, telling well, there's, that leads into sort of two different threads that I wanted to get into. One um, is this idea of the openness and the fusion of Mexican food and, and, and both in Mexico and in the U.S. And that's something that's really fascinating to me. And, and you said very early in the talk how Mexico is also an immigrant culture. And I, uh, we watched last week, um, some of us here watched the Ugly Delicious episode. Cool. Um, and the, with the, the portion on the Arab tacos. Yeah, yeah. And I'm Armenian, which is kind of fun because like the shawarma, and I didn't realize, I always think of uh, after the Armenian genocide, everybody coming to the US, but no, a, a lot of Armenians and a lot of other uh, cultures that would propagate that kind of food also went to Mexico and particularly in Puebla. So can you talk a little bit about this openness that, that exists in Mexico that we maybe don't know about or don't realize? The reason Mexican food is one of the world's great cuisines is specifically because it is a cuisine of mixtures, a mongrel cuisine, if you would, or, or a mestizo cuisine, but it's always mixing. That's why I, like, I go insane, or at the very least, very angry when people insist there's such a thing as authentic Mexican food. So remember, that was one of my assumptions. So I believe at one point there was an authentic Mexican food, what your abuelita, what your grandma makes for you at home, and then there's a fake Mexican food, your Taco Bells, your uh, El Toritos, or you know, Taco John's, or all of that. So I believe that, but then I was as I was going around the United States, I realized, and just did more research, I realized that's a, fall, you know, that, that's a fool's argument. You want to talk about authentic Mexican food? Okay, let's do it. Those wonderful carne asada tacos, well, beef and chicken and pork, 
they didn't exist until the Spaniards came in, and you, you know, so that that's only since the 1500s. Those, um, you know, the like al pastor, al pastor, you know, pork on a spit that came with Lebanese and Armenian immigrants who came to Central Mexico around the 1920s, 1930s. Those wonderful Mexican beers, your bohemias, your uh, tecates, your um, you know, uh, carta blanca, and all that. That all those are all lagers. They're all German pilsners. Ger you know, lagers and pilsners. Bohemia is not named after the last Aztec emperor of Mexico, folks. <laughs> and on and on, tequila came with distillation coming from the Philippines, actually, through the Manila galleons. And that's what makes Mexican food so vital. It could change again and again. Now, if you go to Mexico, like, you know, what are the, what's the most popular soft drink in Mexico? Mexican Coke. What are people eating? White bread, pan bimbo, which is just white bread. Like, all of that came through America. And so in Mexico, you accept that food and you make it something else. When you have a cuisine that does not evolve, it gets boring. I love sauerkraut. What was the last innovation in sauerkraut? Like none, it's just there, you know? <laughs> German cuisine, and it's interesting because German cuisine had its moment in the American sun. Hamburgers, hot dogs, right. you know, just, just the grilling tradition, brats and all that. But that was over a century ago. You, I mean, you, you, German food just became part of the American landscape. But now people think of German food, in, you know, I think incorrectly. And they think, ah, it's just like boring and not flavorless when it really isn't because even in Germany, now you have curry worse and you have like, it's all about those immigrant traditions. So when you try to keep a cuisine in amber, like encased in amber, that's when it becomes boring. Do you think that Mexican culture is more open than other cultures? Is that a statement that can be made? I, I won't talk. I won't talk about other cultures just because that's not my place to do so. I can say though, I, like again, my you know my parents are Mexicans. I consider myself very proudly to be Mexican. And so, what was my Mexican food? Let's see. My mom would make fettuccine alfredo. Then I'd put a bunch of hot sauce on it. <laughs> we thought that was Mexican. Um, my favorite, of course, you get uh, that now. Uh, Doritos are so popular. They'll make. Uh, tapatio flavored Doritos, tapatios being like a Mexican hot sauce that's better than Tabasco. So you get tapatio flavored Doritos and then you put more tapatio on top of it. Um, the big, the big, um, the big Mexican snack, I wonder if you folks have it here, but it's called Tostilocos. So you get a bag of Tostitos, uh, which, you know, corn chips, and then you like make it to whatever you want. So like the classical pr uh, preparation of tostilocos would be some pickled pig skin. You put some Japanese peanuts, uh, which Japanese peanuts is just uh, peanuts soaked in soy. Uh, Japanese peanuts, you put some, uh, gr uh, some uh, pickled onions in there, maybe a little bit of meat, and then you douse it all in something called chamoy. Chamoy is like this, it's hard to describe, but it's like a sauce that's spicy and savory and sweet at the same time, it's like cut with tamarind and all that. It's a my parents didn't grow up eating tostilocos. <laughs> it's a total bastardization, Instagram-ready food, but that's the big trend. Again, and it keeps going again and again. It's slowly spreading across the United States. If it hasn't come to Cedar City, it soon will. And it's good. It's absolutely good. And tostilocos, and yeah, and you use tostilocos. You don't use authentic Mexican chips because, I don't know, for whatever reason, and it came from Tijuana. Border cities are always the best because you have all this stuff. Or people say Mexicans don't eat yellow cheese. Go to Mexico City, their tortas, their Mexican sandwiches, a lot of them have yellow cheese now. For whatever reason, it hit. Well, and, and the other topic that kind of um, in the time that we have left, I know um, the, the, the appropriation of Mexican food. And, and we were talking a little bit about uh, the 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 image of the president having a, a taco salad and how, you know, a lot of people are first to say, wait a minute, this, there's something wrong with it. <laughs> but you don't feel that way. You sort of feel differently. Like, that's a good thing, right? It was the funniest thing. So if you remember, I think it was, yeah, 2016 for Cinco de Mayo, then-candidate Trump, he tweets out a picture, I love the Hispanic people, and there's a picture of him in his desk with a big old taco salad. Oh, my Lord, did people go nuts. It was... It, it, it was out of control. And so, you know, you could have many, many things against Trump if you do not like Trump. But I, but, and so people are just, and of course, any, anytime there's any news, anything on Mexican food, people start tagging me on Twitter. So I'm just getting this whole flood and they're all expecting me because I was very vociferous in my opposition to uh, Trump. Just, they're expecting me to trash him. But I look at the picture, I'm like, no, no, I'm gonna defend Trump on his choice of taco salad. People are saying taco salad is not real Mexican food. And of course, Trump would like taco salad because he's inauthentic, blah, blah, blah. So I do this post saying, you know, again, you, you could have many reasons to oppose Trump, but the fact that he himself likes Mexican food 
is a step in the right direction because historically the way to demonize a people completely 100% is to basically say your food is inedible. The first depictions of uh, the the first um, accounts of Mexican food in American letters dates back to the Texan War, you know, revolution when they separated from Mexico and the soldiers who were there, they just said the you know, the Mexicans are evil people basically because they like chili pepper, this stuff from hell, literally. They had there was this dispatch that I talk about my in my book that People said that, you know, okay, so the Battle of Goliad, they, had a, you know, they just let the Mexican soldiers just, uh, their, their corpses rot there. And so a decade later, a guy was writing about how cows went to the pasture over, you know, that grew over those uh, dead Mexican soldiers. And they died because the grass was contaminated with the blood of those Mexican soldiers that was completely spiked with chili peppers. And so you see that in epithets that people use against people that they don't like. So Mexicans called beaners. French called, you know, frog eaters, you know, all the slurs that people use about Chinese and what they supposedly eat. So you use that to demonize people. So the fact that you have someone eating the food and liking it, that's a step in the right direction. It's a baby step, but it's a step. And then specifically about the taco salad, no, the taco salad is a Mexican dish. Uh, it was invented by the same Morales family at Disneyland. And I would say a good taco salad's not bad. You have the crunch, you get the sour cream, you get the picadillo, the ground beef, a little bit of lettuce, you put some salsa. It's not my favorite dish, but if you have a good one, it's not a bad thing. Well, and that leads me to kind of a great sort of getting to closing question, and I'm sure you get asked this all the time. Do you have a current favorite taco or favorite dish or oh favorite God. place? And I know it probably, there's millions and it changes <laughs> all the time, but is there something that you're really turned on about right now? I had the food at Brody's yesterday. That was really good. Taco was <laughs> really, really good. No, seriously, no messing around. The horchata especially was great. Um, well, recently what I've been doing uh, for the NPR station down in Southern California, KCRW, I've been uh, part of what we call the tortilla tournament. So Think Final Four style, 64 tortillas, 32 corn, 32 flour, four brackets, ranked one through 16, all going down. The final is this Sunday. I'm, if you folks can drive all the way to seven hours down there, why not? But the four best tortillas in Southern California, two corn, two flour, we're gonna match them up to see who is a true champion, corn or flour. Oh, so wow. right now I'm just looking for tortillerias. Like I'm looking for people who make fresh tortillas. I'm looking for great tor tortillas. If you think flour tortillas are terrible, you've never had a good flour tortilla in your life. If you think you know what corn tortillas are, you probably don't only because most of the stuff that you can buy at whatever the supermarket chain is here, Kroger's or Albertsons or whatever, excuse my ignorance on that, but most of them come from one company. You're probably buying for flour mission tortillas or if you're buying corn, probably Guerrero tortillas. They're both terrible. They both taste, they, they, they taste worse than cardboard, and it's done for a specific purpose. I can't go into the whole, oh no. I know what I'm talking about when it comes to this. <laughs> I won't go into the whole story, but the, the people who make, the company that makes Mission and, and uh, Guerrero tortillas is a company called Gruma. I tell the whole nasty story in my book, but uh, a food, uh, big food publication recently did a story on them with the title, and they made it up, not me. They called them the Tortilla Cartel. Yep, they're that nasty and that they're, that they're, they're that dangerous to tortilla culture in both the United States and Mexico. So eat your local tortillas. Someone makes them, I promise you. But when you get a good tortilla, it's a life-altering uh, taste. Absolutely. Oh, you laugh, but... Go, go to Sonora, go get a good flour tortilla, mind blown. And tortillas IDs. have even found their way to the astronauts. Tortillas That's are in outer space. Oh, <laughs> astronauts love flour tortillas because unlike bread, they don't leave crumbs. And remember, we're talking about a space station or a shuttle, everything's very sensitive. And you could, I mean, you could put in peanut butter and jelly, you could put butter, you could eat them as is. And so apparently, I haven't been to this place, but there's a, a flour tortilla shop right next to or near NASA's headquarters in Houston where the astronauts go before they go. They go up in space and they take a, a and, and they don't have like special preservatives. They just get it right fre fresh off the stove. That's it's fantastic. amazing. Well, that's, that's such an appropriate, you know, way. Okay, tortillas are in outer space. Tortillas you know, are cosmic. <laughs> they're cosmic. <laughs> And last question, what do you think the future holds? Do you think it's just gonna keep mixing, keep melding? Do you, is there a cap? Will it, is there a fame cap? What, what does the future no. hold? Again, I describe Mexican food in the United States 
as a seven layer bean dip. So you start at the top, Americans, and I, and I always land on the Americans, of course. Americans, they hear about a food, a Mexican food, and so they go out and seek it. Either they travel to Mexico, they cook it at home, they go to a Mexican restaurant, and they eat that food, and they love it, and then it becomes part of their day-to-day -day diet, and then they say, okay, what's next? This is no longer authentic. I want something, quote, unquote, more authentic. So though I don't believe in the concept of authenticity with food, I do, I do appreciate and uh, respect the, the allure of it to make, to make food better, not just with Mexican food, of course, any ethnic cuisine. And so it goes on and on and on. So at one point, Taco Bell was considered to be authentic food because it was not too removed from the base. Now, of course, it's all the way down here. Now you have at the top taco trucks or molcajetes or whatnot. Another food's gonna come. Like I, like I said, um, uh, those tostilocas are coming your way. Uh, do you guys have bacon-wrapped hot dogs here, Mexican style? I don't think so. They're coming your way. <laughs> They've been going up I-5 and down um, I-10 uh, I especially. I guess they haven't made that hook up to I-15, but we were talking about it recently. So like you have the, well, you had Roberto's here and you have Alberto's. The Bertos from uh, Las Vegas came from San Diego and now are spreading across the Southwest. There's, if you think your Mexican food is bad right now, although I wouldn't say that about here, but trust me, there's someone better because they see that there's a market there and they're gonna come and they wanna make that fortune. Well, Gustavo, thank you so much thank for your you. time. The Gracias. book is Taco USA. It's available today for sale and for signing. And thank you so much for the discussion and the generosity of your time. Thank you all for coming Gracias. so much. Gracias. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. Thank See you. See you next week. Thank you.